Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark. Do you use the internet? Well, of course you do. Do you have personal information that you would rather remain personal? Well, who doesn't? Well, let me tell you something. The internet's all kind of weird. There are people out there who want to ruin your day. They want to take your details, steal your identity. That's a thing, and it's a pain in the ass. Surfshark has hacklocked. This searches database for your passwords, which sounds like a bad thing, but no. Surfshark are the good guys. They let you know if your password has been breached and they'll let you know that you need to change it. But the best thing about Surfshark is, of course, its VPN. It allows you to get a whole bunch of streaming options that you never had before. For me, I live over in Europe. The Netflix selection and other streaming services selection often a lot better in America or other places around the world. But you can use a VPN to access those. And if you're thinking, oh, Simon, I live in America, I don't need a VPN to access European Netflix. Oh, well, let me tell you, there's a ton of stuff that is not available over there that is available here. Vice versa, you just get a whole lot more options with a VPN. Also, Surfshark is totally unlimited, and there are, of course, no logs kept, and they've got great support and a 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't like it, but you will. Go to surfshark.deals forward slash ITS for 83% off and three extra months for free. And now today's video. It was the 8th of November 1990, almost exactly one year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the last days of that standoff known as the Cold War. For decades, the world's been on the verge of a devastating conflict between the Western and Eastern blocs, fearing a mutually assured destruction brought about by the enmity between the capitalist and the communist ideologies. The Cold War had occasionally flared up at localized conflicts by proxy, many of which had been fought or sponsored by shadowy organizations, of which the general public knew little or nothing about. On that fateful day, a man stood up in front of an assembly of more than 300 senators and ministers and disclosed a shocking truth to the world. That man was the Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti. At the 449th session of the Italian Senate, he revealed the existence of Gladio, a secret militarized organization that had been operating in Italy and other Western countries for more than four decades. That day, the world found out about the Stay Behind Network, NATO's secret armies to resist against a Soviet invasion. Like dominoes falling, other European leaders admitted to the truth. Since 1948, secret military and civilian units had been covertly training, planning, and equipping themselves to face a not-so-unthinkable prospect a full-blown attack on Western Europe by Soviet and Warsaw Pact countries. The mission of these sleeper cells was to immediately spring into action, extracting politicians to safety, setting up resistance movements, demolishing infrastructure, and harassing the invaders with guerrilla attacks. Their brief, however, may have gone several steps further. Gladio and other similar organizations may have been involved in clandestine operations including propaganda, counterintelligence, false flag operations, subversion of democratic institutions, and even state-sponsored terrorism. The ultimate goal of these actions was to prevent the rise to power of socialist or communist parties in Western Europe, if necessary, by favoring the rise of military hunters and right-wing regimes. These allegations have been popularized by Swiss historian Daniel Ganser, author of the controversial NATO's Secret Armies, Operation Gladio, and Terrorism in Western Europe. Ganser's allegations and methodology have been both defended and criticized by academia and media outlets. Was there a widespread conspiracy coordinated by NATO and the CIA to steer the West towards authoritarianism and against communism? The overall picture is very complex, and many of the details are still obscure, so let's proceed in order. By February of 1948, Europe was already divided along the Iron Curtain, the fault line of the conflict of ideologies. From the 21st to the 25th of that month, a communist coup d'etat took place in Czechoslovakia, adding another territory to the shadow of Moscow. The prospect that the leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, may seek to expand his sphere of influence became suddenly very realistic. The sound of rolling tanks marked by a red star made its way into the nightmares of the West. On the 18th of June 1948, U.S. State Department advisor George Keenan and the U.S. National Security Council launched a new initiative, the Office of Policy Coordination, or the OPC. Keenan was the engine behind the Marshall Plan, the project of economic aid to rebuild Europe post-World War II. But his new brainchild was a completely different affair. 
The OPC was a covert operations unit set up to create stay-behind networks in Europe, a sort of preemptive resistance movement to fight a potential communist invasion. After the formation of NATO in April 1949, this Western military alliance took over the plan, creating two separate sets of entities, Stay Behind Units SBUs, and Stay Behind Organizations SBOs. SBUs were composed of professional military personnel. By the early 1950s, the bulk of their forces were constituted by the 21st and 23rd SAS regiments of the British Army, as well as the US 10th Special Forces Group. They were joined one decade later by the Special Reconnaissance Squadron of the British Royal Armoured Corps. In in case of a Warsaw Pact attack across the east-west German border, the bulk of NATO forces in West Germany had to fall back to the west bank of the River Rhine. But the units that we just mentioned had to stay behind and delay the progress of communist forces. They were to split into smaller contingents, hiding in prefab shelters equipped with periscopes, field radios, as well as brandy and chocolates, because you gotta know how to live. From there, they were to acquire targets on behalf of NATO's artillery and missile batteries, who were ready to rain down tactical nukes on the advancing enemy. Given the occasion, the SBUs could launch targeted assassinations or demolish enemy installations, inspired by their field manual, Total Resistance, a guerrilla warfare handbook written by the Swiss Army Major Hans von Dach. Another part of their mission was to lead resistance movements in the occupied lands. To accomplish this task, SBUs would be supported by civilians recruited into stay behind organizations, or SBOs, such as the Italian Gladio. While the actions of the SBUs were directed at a NATO level, SBOs were to remain under national command. In 1952, SBOs were coordinated by NATO's Clandestine Planning Committee and later by the Allied Coordination Committee. But the scope of these bodies was to only train and to direct local SBOs for two purposes, attacking the Warsaw Pact military and rescuing NATO pilots who were downed over Europe. All other activities conducted by an SBO were the sole responsibility of that country's government or security services, which left them freedom of interpretation as to what exactly they were meant to be doing. SBOs mushroomed in most NATO countries, with few exceptions, the UK and the Republic of Ireland, as well as the microstates. Well, not all of the little guys were excluded from the game, as Luxembourg had its own network. Even the US recognized the need for an SBO to defend Alaska, the most likely route for a Soviet invasion via Siberia. Set up in June 1950, this was known as WASHTUB, a joint operation of the FBI and the Office of Special Investigations, the Air Force's intelligence service. Eventually, the overall scheme extended to non-NATO members, formerly neutral countries like Switzerland, Sweden, and Finland. Each SBO had its own local flavor in terms of recruitment, training, structure, equipment, and mission statement. Thanks to extensive parliamentary inquiries and freedom of information requests, the best documented operations are the ones in Alaska, Italy, and Switzerland, washed up Gladio and P26, respectively. Now I'm going to concentrate on these three to extrapolate some examples and common themes. First, Recruitment. How were the sleeper anti-Soviet agents selected? FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover himself delineated the ideal profile for his Alaskan guerrillas. They were to be picked amongst unskilled or semi-skilled workers, provided they were not actively engaged in a labor union to prevent communist infiltration. These candidates were less likely to be deported or executed by the Red Army. The local Inupat population and women were excluded from the start, both categories deemed to be unreliable. Although declassified files prove the enlistment of at least one woman, who was a former teacher, turned gold dredger. New agents were to be grouped into cells of four to six individuals, one cell per 5,000 civilians. Each unit was coordinated by a principal who gave authority to his men or women to recruit further operatives on the condition that the leader's identity remained secret. Similar criteria to this were implemented over in Italy. Recruiters from the military secret services preferred middle-aged, low-key, even disabled civilians. Again, they were less likely to attract the attention of potential invaders. But the early days of Gladio saw an influx of young Younger, physically fit individuals, especially former partisans with experience of alpine guerrilla warfare against Nazis and other fascists. In all cases, the selection excluded candidates with extremist political views on both sides of the spectrum and those with an excessively trigger-happy attitude. 
The so-called gladiators, 622 in total, were organized into small, tight-knit cells who eventually also welcomed women into their ranks. A hairdresser with a talent for shooting was the first female gladiator. The Swiss SBO P26 was an exception, as it included active military personnel at the top and intermediate levels of the chain of command. The resistance fighters on the ground were all civilians, albeit with former military training. The ideal P-26er had to be a low-profile and trustworthy individual with a regular job which could provide cover for frequent training leaves. Traveling salesman, for example. Each unit consisted of six to ten members spread in 80 locations across the country. Units were split into two cells, one active and one sleeper. The active cell was coordinated by an operational chief, leading a communications expert, courier, and a demolition specialist. Despite their competence, these operatives were expected to fall very quickly into Soviet hands. For this reason, its members didn't even know about the existence of the sleepers, lest they reveal their names or location under torture. It was then time for the sleeper cell to kick into gear. As you may expect, training for all SBO agents was frequent, intensive, and pretty brutal. The best documented training curriculum comes from the parliamentary inquiries on Gladio. Italian volunteers were flown to a boot camp in a location kept secret even to them. It was later revealed to be the training center for saboteurs near Argero, Sardinia. Here, recruits completed five basic modules, collection and transmission of intelligence, sabotage, counter-propaganda against invaders, exfiltration of high-profile individuals, and guerrilla warfare. The sabotage school, for example, included a realistic obstacle course in which gladiators learned how to negotiate barbed wire and glass-topped walls before blowing up military installations with plastic explosives. The training was complemented with field exercises. Exfiltration specialists had to practice crossing the Alps in Windsor to release their high-level wards into Switzerland or France. Guerrilla experts joined Italian special forces and U.S. Navy SEALs in war games such as Altina 74, which simulated ambushes against the Red Army on the border with Austria and Yugoslavia. The course was completed with the sixth module, which taught each gladiator to independently recruit and run their own partisan organization. The Swiss and Alaskan counterparts of Gladio were trained in a similar way, but the field exercises of P-26 deserved just a little extra bit of attention. P-26s were trained in Britain by SAS and MI6 operatives, arguably a violation of Switzerland's neutral status. After 1972, British security services organized regular exercises codenamed Targum. Trainee cells had to reach the UK incognito, collect a consignment of secret messages, evade police controls, and eventually sabotage an oil refinery. In the last act of Targum, recruits had to jump from a low-flying helicopter onto the deck of a motorboat or a surfaced submarine. <laughs> Some James Bond shit right there. Maybe this is why, in the 1979 exercises, a Swiss Secret Service official arranged for his mistress to participate. James Bond or what? <laughs> a common attribute of all training programs was a proficiency in both unarmed and armed combat. All SBO networks, except for Luxembourg, had access to firearms. Arsenals were stored in secret weapons caches, generally located near the most likely invasion routes. Italian Gladio had planted 139 such caches across the nation, the majority in the northeastern regions. Codenamed NASCOs, they were usually located in disused quarries, caves, or even under deconsecrated churches. They typically stored a variety of field radios, binoculars, knives, and small arms. Larger NASCOs could include hand grenades, TNT, plastic explosives, mortars, and even 57mm field guns. And all of that was just lying around right under civilians' noses. For at least four decades, most Western countries maintained units of highly secretive, highly trained operatives, numbering in the thousands. A veritable shadow army, they answered only to a restricted number of decision makers in the military, the secret services, and the government. Your neighbor who left home for frequent business trips, your photographer friend who went on hunting expeditions, your hairdresser who disappeared for weeks at a time to visit relatives. Anyone could have been a sleeper operative with access to enormous firepower stashed in a dark basement. The resulting picture is intriguing, to say the least. But it could also be a bit unnerving. It depends on each SBO's primary mission brief. For most networks, the key priority was about survival of the national institutions. 
In other words, to spirit away to safety those fellow citizens who most likely would be killed or captured by the Soviet invaders in the first days of an invasion. These included top-ranking civil servants, military officers, cabinet ministers, and members of royal families. For example, networks in the Benelux countries all had plans to exfiltrate their cabinets and royals to the UK, where they could establish governments in exile. The French SBO, known as Misha 48, had formulated the Plan Smaller in case of a Soviet attack, the French government and chiefs of staff were to be evacuated to Algeria, where they could plan for the reconquest of the mainland. The second strategic point for SBOs was to collect intelligence on enemy strength and movements so that they could feed them back to their exiled governments and other NATO allies. Finally, they were to harass and sabotage Warsaw Pact personnel and institutions, essentially set Europe ablaze. The leaders of several stay-behind networks, however, realize that an all-out attack on the West may never take place. Hence, some of these organizations were designed and empowered to carry out peacetime missions to prevent local communist and socialist parties from acquiring too much power. This was even though NATO's Coordinated Committee for SBOs, the ACC, didn't have a generalized master plan for internal peacetime activities. The inquiry on the Swiss network, P26, led by Judge Pierre Cornu, found that a 1979 training exercise simulated acts of sabotage against an unspecified extremist government which had taken power in Switzerland. The elements gathered during the inquiry allows to state that resistance organizations would have probably sprang into action not only in the case of a foreign occupation, but also in case of the Communist Party or similar political force gaining power. In a similar fashion, a report by the Italian parliament quotes a military intelligence document of June 1959, according to which SBOs were intended to resist against internal subversion. More examples of internally focused activities come from France. Alongside their plan Smaller, Mission 48 initiated Plan Cloven with CIA backing. The aim was to reduce the influence of the local Communist Party within schools, universities, the civil service, and trade unions. And in November 1990, the then head of the French military intelligence, Admiral Coste, admitted that back in 1961, several Mission 48 agents had joined a domestic terror group. This was the OAS, the Organization of the Secret Army, which opposed President de Gaulle's colonization of Algeria, and claimed some 2,000 lives. The CIA also provided backing to the West German stay behind the BDJ, which enlisted several former Wehrmacht and Waffen SS officers. The CIA memo of February 1952 states The BDJ is already at present one of the most potent mechanisms for political warfare purposes. In fact, it is the only mass organization through which we can carry out a wide variety of assignments by issuing direct orders. A BDJ member, former SS officer Hans Otto, confessed to the existence of the network to Frankfurt police. In a raid of its premises, officers found evidence that the CIA had subsidized the BDJ to the tune of $50,000 a month. In April 1953, another CIA memo referenced a document issued by West Germany's Social Democrat Party. This paper claims that the true aims of the BDJ were the subversion of the moderate government in favor of a more authoritarian anti-communist regime. Yet another CIA-backed organization was a Ginz Oppressor, a Lisbon-based paramilitary group disguised as a press agency. It had been founded in September of 1966 by former French officer and OAS co-founder Yves Guerin-Sirac. In addition to serving as an informal SBO for Portugal, a Ginz Oppressor provided training to far-right and pro-colonialist paramilitary and terror groups in Europe, Africa, and South America. One of the alleged clients of a Ginza was the Greek military regime installed with the coup of April the 20th, 1967, an action which may have benefited from support by the local stay-behind group known as LOK, or the Hellenic Raiding Force. Supervised directly by Field Marshal Alexander Papagos, it was set up chiefly as a resistance network against the Warsaw Pact. But its secondary mission was to counteract a potential communist coup in Athens. To this end, LOK personnel had been trained in the execution of the Prometheus Plan, a NATO anti-coup contingency plan. The April 1967 coup, which installed Papagos as right-wing government, followed the Prometheus blueprints. This prompted suspicions that the LOK network was directly involved in the subversion of democracy. The Turkish stay-behind network may have also been involved in staging not one but two coup d'etats in Ankara in 1971 and 1980. The organization known as counter Guerrilla and Special Warfare Department was accused of perpetrating several massacres against ethnic minorities, communist sympathizers, intellectuals, 
and members of the opposition. Some of these claims come from former members of the organization itself. For example, in 2001, a former commander of the SBO, General Yeri Basoglu, admitted to their involvement in a series of pogroms in September 1955. The 6th to the 7th of December events were also the job of the special warfare. It was a splendid organization, and it achieved its goal. Allegations of violent actions perpetrated by SBOs were also made in Belgium, Luxembourg, and Italy. In Belgium, between 1983 and 1985, a criminal outfit known as the Brab and Killers committed a string of violent robberies, killing 28 people. Following Andriotti's revelations on Gladio, the Belgian Senate inquired whether the Brab and Killers may have been part of the local SBO called SDRA8. The inquiry found no evidence that this network may have been involved in criminal activities and the case remains unsolved. In nearby Luxembourg, the country was shocked by 18 bombing attacks between 1984 and 1986. Among the targets, police stations, the Palace of Justice, and the airport. Luckily, no one died. A trial began only in 2013, with two gendarmerie officers in the dark. The prosecution argued that the defendants aimed to increase funding for law enforcement, but the thesis of the defense was that the real perpetrators were members of the local SBO. As of 2021, no one has been indicted for the bombings. The most controversial and inextricable case of state or NATO-sponsored terrorism concerns Italy, and it is the one that prompted Daniel Genser's research. Italian police, institutions, and civilians were targeted by thousands of terror attacks from 1968 to 1988, attributed to far-right and far-left extremism. The period was known as the Years of lead. One of these killings was the massacre of three police officers in Petiano, northeastern Italy, in May of 1972. In the subsequent trial, the prosecution alleged that the explosive had been obtained from one of Gladio's Nascosses. The self-confessed culprit hinted at the involvement of the military secret services and Gladio. But again, there was no conclusive resolution. Other inquiries during the years of lead found evidence of collusion between rogue factions within the secret services and far-right terrorists. They often infiltrated left-wing groups already violent in their own right to provoke or carry out false flag attacks in their name. The end goal was to turn public opinion against them and to favor the rise of an authoritarian government. This was part of the so-called strategy of tension, carried out by a cabal which included even organized crime and the secretive Masonic Lodge P2. But was Gladio actually involved? This has never been definitively proven, and all party parliamentary inquiries also appear to exonerate the Italian SBO. Surviving Gladio members deny any involvement and have made their names publicly available on their official website, staybehind.it. What we have found in our research, however, is that the ubiquitous Agnita Presser did train many of the leading terrorists involved in the strategy of tension. And according to public prosecutor Sir Joe Dinney, a section of the Secret Service's office D undertook sabotage training at the same Sardinian boot camp used by Gladio. Dinny pointed out that these courses immediately preceded two bombings which killed 20 civilians in 1974. We've just visited a world full of secrets and deceit, a world where truth and fact are mercurial, unstable substances whose structure and foundations are never truly solid. Based on what we know thus far, there wasn't any large-scale conspiracy at a NATO level to turn every single stay-behind organization into an anti-democratic subversive force. Some SBOs, however, had been designed to intervene in case of a communist takeover or to curb the power of left-wing organizations in their country, even violently if necessary. This seems to have been the case in Turkey, Greece, and Portugal. But even if other SBOs appear not to have taken part in similar activities, inquiry into their conduct opens another can of worms. The unholy alliance between secret services and extremists to subvert established order in Italy and other European countries. But this is a story whose final chapters are yet to be written, a story to which we may return in the future when we venture again into the shadows.